Hi, in this unit we'll be taking a look at interactions between living things and in this particular lesson we'll look closely at the habitat and the niche. So first of all we need to differentiate between habitat and niche. Habitat is where an organism actually lives and it includes both biotic and abiotic factors in its environment. If you remember, biotic factors are living. They include plants, animals, decomposers, parasites, all the living things in the environment. Whereas abiotic factors include things like sunlight, soil, water, carbon dioxide, and such. The niche is the unique position occupied by a species. It's the role that a species plays. So you can look over here, these are some things that go under this category of niche. How an organism uses its habitat, the role that it plays in its community. Remember, a community is a group of different species that live in an area and interact with each other. And the niche also includes the effect of an organism on other organisms. So you want to think of the niche as its role, as an organism's role. So for example, this is the beaver's niche. The beaver cuts down trees and it makes dams which redirect water flow, which allow a lot of fish to live in the area, which attract birds to eat the fish, which attract foxes that eat the eggs and the young of the birds, and it actually has this profound effect on the ecosystem. That is the beaver's unique niche, and no other animal plays the same role, same niche as the beaver does. One day, you're going to graduate high school and you're going to decide what to do with your life. And maybe you'll realize that you're really good at presenting an argument and you're very articulate and you like to debate and you'll realize that your niche is to be a lawyer. Or maybe you're very compassionate and you love human anatomy and problem solving and your niche will be in the medical professions. So that is the niche. It's a role that an organism plays. Now, in the wild, there is fierce competition for survival. Therefore, an organism's niche is limited, it's small. Now, there is something known as a fundamental niche, which is the entire range of conditions where a species could potentially survive. But there's the realized niche, which is the actual niche that a species has, which is smaller than the fundamental niche because a species is competing with other organisms for the same niche. And we'll clarify this a little bit more in the future, but for now, just understand the terms fundamental niche and realized niche, and just understand that realized niche is the actual niche and it's smaller than the fundamental niche. Okay, competitive exclusion. This rule states that two species cannot occupy the same exact niche. There are different outcomes for competitive exclusion, but basically, two organisms cannot have the same exact role. So for example, in our gut are bacteria, and this is usually a good thing. We have good bacteria, like the ones up here at the top, and they colonize our gut and they help us. And one of the ways that these bacteria help us is this has to do with competitive exclusion. So because these bacteria have made your gut their home and reproduced and taken up all the space, these uh, bacteria over here, the bad bacteria, harmful bacteria, can't colonize your gut. There just isn't room for them. They can't compete with the good bacteria. And if, you're, if, um, if your system is balanced, then you have all this good bacteria and you don't get these types of infections. Okay, so what happens when there is competition? Uh, what happens if two organisms try to take on the same niche? And here is an example from my life. So I used to dive, and you can see me here. And here are some pictures I took while diving of a Caribbean coral reef. So you can see there's lots of coral life. This is a healthy coral reef, healthy ecosystem. These are actually pictures of photos because I couldn't find the digital files anywhere. But you can still see that there's healthy coral here. So at one point, we were um, diving in the Bahamas and what we saw was drastically different from the previous picture. And this picture I actually didn't take because I didn't feel inspired to take pictures because there was a lot of damaged coral and it made me really sad, but I did take the picture on the right. And what's happening here is that algae is coming into the area and it's trying to get the same niche as the coral. 
It's trying to uh, perform the same role. It's try trying to take up the ocean floor space in areas with good sunlight. And the problem is they can't both be in the same niche. And in this particular case, it's not the coral that wins. The coral loses and dies out and the algae just spreads and devastates the coral reef ecosystem. So competitive exclusion outcomes. The first one is what we just discussed. One species is better suited and the other one gets pushed out and it dies or it moves. That's like the example with the coral, right? The algae wins, the coral loses, and everything turns into this wasteland covered by algae. The second thing can happen is not so doom and gloom. It's an example where organisms divide a habitat so that they don't compete. So they have different niches in one environment. And here is a good example. These birds here are called warblers and they all feed on this tree. And every single one of these birds, if they were left alone to do whatever they wanted, they would feed on the whole entire tree. That is their fundamental niche. However, they can't all have the same niche. Therefore, they've divided up the tree. So you can see here, each bird is feeding off a different part of the tree. So each bird has a different realized niche. And the third thing that can happen when competition occurs is an evolutionary response where the two species will physically change over time. They will evolve over time. An example of this happened in Puerto Rico with these lizard species. And what happened is um, they were in competition with each other, so over time they evolved to be very different from each other. And you can see their bodies and their sizes are different, allowing to, them to um, have different niches, different roles that they play. And now they are no longer in competition with each other. This is called resource partitioning, where competing species evolve to use non-overlapping resources so that they're taking up different parts of the tree or shrubs or small different species of trees and they're not in direct competition with each other. They each have their own unique niche. And the last part we want to talk about today is ecosystem resiliency. Now, biodiversity helps to make an ecosystem more resilient. We learned about biodiversity in the last lesson, and we know biodiversity is the number and variety of species living in an ecosystem. And areas with, with high biodiversity can adapt to change. For example, if there's a hurricane or if there's human impact on the area, it can bounce back faster if it's a high biodiversity area. Predation. Um, predators help to increase biodiversity, biodiversity. Predators aren't always bad. They don't just kill. They help to keep an ecosystem more balanced so that the prey doesn't overrun the entire ecosystem and you have a balanced amount of each different type of species. Predators help to keep populations healthy. You have the example of deer in New Jersey. Their natural predator was the wolf, which we got rid of. And now we have issues with imbalances in ecosystems where the deer just reproduce out of control, right? And they cause accidents, uh, they spread Lyme disease, and um, they overfeed on vegetation. So predation helps to increase biodiversity. I hope that was helpful. Next time we'll look at different relationships between organisms. Thank you.